The current generation of the Hyundai i30 hatch has been with us for more than seven years now. That's a long time in car terms, and it's just had another substantial update. There's a lot more to the story though of this 2025 model than you might otherwise think. So in this video, we're gonna tell you why that is, take you through the updated exterior styling, run through all the new tech inside, and of course, hit the road to tell you if that new turbocharged mild hybrid engine is up to the task. Let's find out. For 2024, there's only one version of the regular i30 hatch you can buy, the Sporty N-Line. And it's now built in Europe alongside the i30 N hot hatch, rather than South Korea like the i30 sedan. What that means is a higher price. The range starts from $40,000 or thereabouts, depending on where in Australia you live. But it is offset by some new features as well as some mechanical changes we'll detail a bit later in this video. Among the changes is this new look front end for the N-Line variant. It looks a lot like the i30 N hot hatch. It's been on sale in Australia for a couple of years now, since 2020. The big changes are these V-shaped headlights, as well as new look bumper, and there's new plastic inserts. Now this front end has been on sale in overseas markets in Europe for a couple of years now, but it never came to Australia with the last update for the i30 in 2020, due to some production issues, and in fact, it was built in South Korea. It's here now, and I've got to say, I do think it gives the car a sharper and more modern look overall. Some other changes include these new 8-inch alloy wheels, these silver accented side skirts down the side, some new LED tail lights, as well as some changes to the rear bumper. Overall, the body shell is the same as before. There's no major changes to the appearance, but just some things here and there to make it look a little bit fresher and hide some of its age. There are initially two models in the regular 2025 i30 hatch range, the N-Line and the N-Line Premium. Prices start from $36,000 for on-road costs, which is $3,500 more than the old base N-Line, but a whopping 12 grand more than the previous most affordable i30 hatch. We're testing the N-Line Premium, priced from $41,000 for on-road costs. $3,700 more than before, or 45885 drive away in Sydney with metallic paint. Standard features in the top grade include LED headlights, 18 inch alloy wheels, dual 10.25 inch displays for the instruments and infotainment, wide Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, a power adjustable driver's seat, leather and suede upholstery, wireless phone charging, and a six speaker stereo. Rivals for the Hyundai i30 include the Volkswagen Golf, a reigning drive car of the year category winner, plus the Toyota Corolla Hybrid and Mazda 3. There are plenty of new and used examples of these cars available on Drive Marketplace. Head over to our website to check that out now. If you've sat in or seen photos of one of Hyundai's newer models, think the Kona, the Santa Fe, or even the i30 sedan, the cabin of this i30 hatch may feel a little bit old hat in 2024. There's a lot of gray and black around the place, and the design hasn't changed that much since this car came out in 2017. But in some ways, that's a good thing. You've got a normal dial for controlling the volume, traditional climate control dials for the dual zone air conditioning system, and overall, it just feels traditional. There's no touch sensitive sliders or too much to distract you off the road. It just feels old school in the best way possible. Leading the changes inside for this 2024 update is this new 10.25 inch digital instrument cluster. It's not the most customizable, especially compared to a Volkswagen Golf in this size class, but it definitely looks better than the old seven inch display you got in the previous end line. And you can change the colors between different drive modes. And it does show enough between trip computer information and where you're going, all those kind of things you'd expect of an instrument display. Also new for this update is this gloss black trim around the center console. Now it looks fantastic when the car is new. As you can see, this car only has 2000 Ks on the clock and it already is covered in dust and it has a couple scratches on it as well. Now, I personally think it does look better than the matte gray in the old car, even with the marks and the scratches on it that are already here. But what do you think? Give us a like if you agree, comment below if you don't and you think the old gray was better than this gloss black plastic. One of the things you get by spending a bit more on this inline premium version over the base inline is this infotainment screen. It's a 10.25 inch display. It's not new for this update, but it does gain over the air software updates. So you can update it remotely without having to go to a dealer and have to plug it in and update the software, as well as support for the Hyundai Blue Link phone app. So you can control the locks, the windows remotely, see where the car is, as well as do things like activate an emergency SOS call function. So it's a helpful feature and definitely something that other brands are moving to in 2024. Now there's only wired CarPlay, not wireless, which is a bit annoying. Same for Android Auto as well. But it does have built-in sat-nav as well as AM, FM, and DAB digital radio. Now it's not the fastest system on the market, but it is fast enough for what you need to do. It doesn't really feel too laggy, still even in 2024. Though it is, again, not the fastest. And newer Hyundai cars, such as the Kona and the Santa Fe, have moved forward with a newer infotainment screen that is faster and easier to use. Now, one of my favorite features from the old end line were the cool red seat belts. Those are no longer here for this European made car. Same goes for the red outlines around the air vents, but you do have a little red outline around the start button, which is kind of neat. And overall materials in this car are pretty nice. 
There's some hard plastic on the dash here, and it would be nice to see maybe a color contrasting element here. But overall, you've got soft leather-like materials on the armrests, both on the doors and the center console. Some soft materials on the door tops and the dash top, but overall, feels well built and pretty premium for the price so some rivals Volkswagen Golf for example have moved forward in terms of interior presentation since this i30 came out in 2017. And anyways wise this n-line premium version is very well appointed in terms of features you've got this panoramic sunroof in this grade plus wireless phone charging dual zone climb control heated front seats and heated steering wheel plus two usb ports one usb c which is new for 2024 and usb a as well as a 12 volt socket in the center console box now storage wise is also pretty good you've got decent sized glove box and center console the door bins have little pockets for storing bottles which is great so they don't rattle around too much while you're driving You've got two cup holders, some storage slots near the wireless phone charger, as well as this handy little slot behind the parking brake. It's great for storing the key or storing your sunglass. You've also got some storage up there if you also want to put your sunglasses up there instead. Overall, it's a nice cabinet. It's feeling a little bit old now, but it still feels practical and it's easy to use and overall really nice. Let's head to the back. Space in the back here is okay, but it's not exceptional for the small car class in 2024. I'm six foot one. This seat is set up for where I drive. As you can see, my knees are touching this front seat back. My head hits the roof. I try and sit up under this sunroof frame. And there's not a whole lot of tow room under the front seats as well. They're sort of jammed in there. Now, shorter passengers will have an easier time of things, as will those in a normal end line, not this premium model, because this has a sunroof which does eat into headroom. Now, there's finally power outlets for rear passengers. You've got two USB ports back here, which you didn't get in the old Korean built car. Plus, rear air vents as well. Map pockets behind the front seats, fold down center armrests, your us usual set of ice fix points in the outboard seats, plus three top tethers, as well as door pockets and space for storing bottles in these doors. Now, overall, yeah, not the best in the class, but definitely not the worst. So you've got this lovely leather and suede trim that I mentioned in the front, and overall, it's comfortable enough for shorter trips, but maybe not for a road trip around Australia, especially if you're tall like me. Let's check out the boot. Open up the manual tailgate and you find the same 395 litre boot as the old i30 N line. Still a really big space, you've got enough room for a full size suitcase and some smaller bags on the side. That's one of the larger cargo areas in the small car class these days. Likes the Corolla, the Mazda 3 have moved towards sportier exterior designs that come with the cost of interior practicality. However, there's a catch. There's no more spare wheel under the floor, instead you've got a tyre repair kit, which is only really useful for smaller punctures, as well as the battery for the mild hybrid system where the spare wheel used to go. A bit frustrating given the state of some of Australia's country roads, that a lot of them are in places with no phone service where if you get a really big flat and can't repair it, you're kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere. Otherwise, it is a pretty practical boot. There's rear seats fold 60-40 for more space, you've got bag hooks, a 12 volt socket, illumination, as well as some tie down points in the floor. Overall, a really good boot space. Now, for all those changes I've mentioned so far seem pretty minor, this is by far where the biggest change has taken place, under the bonnet. Now, gone is the old 1.6 litre turbo engine in the old end line, replaced by a new 1.5 litre turbocharged four-cylinder engine. Now, it might seem like only a small change in capacity, but this new engine is a lot less powerful. 117 kilowatts versus 150 kilowatts for the previous car. The torque is pretty similar, 253 newton metres for this versus 265 newton metres in the previous model. Now it's matched with a seven speed dual clutch automatic transmission as standard and it's aided by a 48 volt mild hybrid system. Now it's not like a Toyota in that it can't drive the wheels on electric power alone, but it can help reduce fuel use by turning the engine off when you're at the traffic lights or while you're rolling. More on that a little bit later. Behind the wheel of the updated i30 N-Line and many of the reasons we loved the old car are still present here. Those Michelin tires give plenty of grip the steering is direct and doesn't feel completely disconnected from the road below. These sports seats are fantastic and overall it's stable, it's really secure in corners and it's just a really, really good car to drive should you find yourself on a nice winding road. The suspension is on the firm side, after all, it is an N-line, but it's not too stiff or uncomfortable to live with in the daily grind. It's certainly not as stiff or as hardcore as a full fat i30N, but you do feel more bumps than you would in a regular i30 hatch. Of course, your taste may differ, so it's worth taking for a test drive before buying. It does mean though, there isn't a whole lot of body roll when you're really pushing it in corners, and it does a pretty good job of soaking up Australia's often not very well surfaced country roads. A few complaints, the steering in sport mode when you're on a nice road is a little bit too heavy for our tastes. Though around town you can put it in eco and normal and it's perfectly fine. And in sport, it also, the gearbox doesn't always respond to a driver's request for downshift, which is also a little bit annoying. There's also quite a lot of tire roar on course chip surfaces. You can turn the stereo up to drown it out, but it just could be better insulated in that regard. Wind noise is relatively well suppressed though. 
Braking performance in an emergency situation is superb, pulling up from 100 km an hour to zero on our satellite timing equipment in 35.4 meters on our first attempt. We were so surprised by this figure, we let the brakes cool down and try it again, only to improve even further, recording a sports car like 34.9 meter stopping distance. That's likely thanks to the Michelin tyres, as the brake discs have been downsized for the latest inline. From 305mm front and 280mm rear in the previous model, to 288mm front and 272mm rear in the updated version. The brake pedal is quite firm when the discs are cool, which will appeal to some, but not others. The updates to the i30 hatch for model year 2025 extend to safety technology. New are blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert, both capable of detecting and braking for obstacles, which are present on regular versions of the old i30 hatch, but not the inline. Traffic sign recognition has also been added, along with a rear occupant alert to warn the driver of kids or pets left in the back seats when the car has been turned off. But where things have taken a step back is under the bonnet. That new one and a half litre engine is more than enough for round town driving or a highway overtakes. It never really feels out of punch in normal conditions. However, when you're on a country road and really trying to enjoy the car, it lacks that little performance sparkle that the old one had. It's not quite as quick and the old N-Line will leave this one in its rear view mirrors. On our satellite tiling equipment, this car did zero to 100 in 8.2 seconds. That's about a second slower than the old N-Line. The numbers certainly don't lie. This is not a slow car by any means, but it's just not quite as quick as that old car, which is one of the reasons why we loved it. The seven speed dual clutch transmission continues to have a few rough edges. There's a bit of a delay when you change between drive and reverse gear, and there is some hesitation at low speeds, but it's not the worst and you can learn to drive around it. And certainly on the move, it does shift quickly enough, though it's not quite as snappy as say, a Volkswagen dual clutch transmission, or even the eight speed dual clutch that's in the i30N, as well as some other newer Hyundai cars, the likes of the Sonata and the Palisade. That mild hybrid system is not a full hybrid like a Toyota, so it can't drive the wheels on electric power alone, nor is there any appreciable difference in performance in terms of acceleration assisting the petrol engine. But it does have an auto start stop system that turns the engine off at speeds below 30 k's an hour when you're still braking towards the traffic lights. And it does restart the engine pretty quickly when the lights go green and you put your foot on the accelerator. In eco mode, with your foot off the accelerator and the car coasting on a relatively flat surface, it will also turn off the engine to let the car freewheel and save a little bit of extra fuel. It's pretty quick when you put your foot back on the accelerator, turn the engine on, there's not much of a vibration when it does so. It's a, it's a cool feature and it does actually save fuel. We've been seeing fuel consumption go as low as five liters or less per 100 kilometers when that coasting feature is really working at its best, which is pretty good for a car that's not a full hybrid and can't actually drive its wheels on anything but petrol power. It does require a certain type of driving to work though. Flowing roads, 60 to 80 kilometers an hour, not much traffic and then just a lot of coasting where the car can actually turn the engine off and save fuel. If you're in stop start traffic and there's a lot of stop go, it will not really work that well. You'll see fuel consumption closer to nine liters per 100 kilometers, which is not fantastic and more what you kind of expect for a car without mild hybrid technology, which is to be expected given it can't drive the wheels on electric power. It is a shame though that engine off coasting feature only works in eco mode because the throttle response in eco at low speeds is pretty sluggish. Normal and sport are far more usable around town and it's a shame that tech doesn't actually work in those modes. So, the i30 N-Line. Sure, it has taken steps back in a few key areas. The one and a half litre engine isn't as punchy as the R1.6. It's more expensive than before and there's no more spare wheel. But to ride it off for those reasons would be doing a disservice to what is otherwise a really well-rounded small car. It's roomy enough inside, the boot is big, it handles really well, has enough of the latest mod cons without drowning you in too much technology, and that mild hybrid system really does save fuel. Sure, it's not the newest kit on the block anymore, but if you're after a small car that makes you feel a little bit special, without stretching all the way to a full hot hatch, the Hyundai i30 N-Line hatch could be the one for you. The small car market isn't as busy as it used to be, but there's still a ton of options available as rivals to this car. Mazda 3, Volkswagen Golf, Toyota Corolla. If you're shopping for a small car, check out Drive Marketplace. We have a ton of new and used examples available for sale around the country through our trusted dealer partners. If a sedan is more your style, Hyundai has you covered. Click up there to watch our video review of the Hyundai i30 sedan hybrid.